Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you about how doing a 5K running race turned into a belief that I can do anything. You see, in my mid-20s, I was enjoying a life that comes with earning an income and no family ties. So I was out drinking three, four, maybe five times a week, basically having a good time but not living a particularly healthy lifestyle. And for some reason, I agreed to take part in a 5K race. Oh, yeah, there were, be, there were going to be drinks at the end of it. That's why I signed up. So, uh, and as you can imagine, I wasn't in particularly great shape at the time, but, um, and I hated running. And to give you an idea of just how much I hated running, I swam to get fit for this running race. <laughs> Needless to say, I had no idea about fitness and training at that point in my life. But I got through the race, and as I crossed the finish line, I had this feeling of, of, of pain. My lungs were fit to burst, my legs ached, and I just felt awful. And I realised that this was not for me. But then, a few months later, a friend of mine asked me, well, kind of challenged me to take part in a triathlon. Uh, and my first response was, absolutely no way. Why on earth would I want to take part in a triathlon? But he kept on pestering me. And I started to look back at that 5K. And you know when you look back at something that was painful at the time, but you don't remember it to be quite as bad as it was? Well, that's how I was thinking about the 5K. And I thought, I can swim and I can cycle, so it should be fine. So with me convincing myself and my friend pestering me, I signed up. A couple of weeks later, I found myself bobbing up and down in a cold lake using a, uh, a borrowed wetsuit. And again, I managed to get through the race, but this time, as I, finished, uh, as I crossed the finish line, I felt amazing. Well, no, I felt awful physically, but I felt me amazing mentally because I'd done something I didn't think I could do, something I couldn't, didn't think I could achieve. And I think it helped that I beat my friend as well. So I, um, I signed up for my next race, and the, but this time I wanted to train harder. You see, now it was on my to-do list. I had to make the time to make the training happen. So I built a training plan, and then I set a routine around that plan. I can't tell you how important routine was for me to make the training happen. I set the day and time for each training session, and then came the easy bit. I just stuck to the plan. If the plan stated that I would go for a swim in Hyde Park at 6 a.m. on a Monday morning, but it was hammering down with rain, I wouldn't think about it. I'd just do it. No excuses. I actually remember one of the first times I uh, swam in Hyde Park. It was pretty early in the year, so the, uh, the water temperature was pretty cold. In fact, some of you may understand when I say it was sex-changingly cold. Um, but I had a new wetsuit, uh, and once I got past the uncontrollable breathing, I started to enjoy myself. Towards the end of the swim, I saw some people on the bank pointing in my direction, and I thought, they must be thinking, this guy's pretty tough. And then I saw their hand movements sort of pointing and gesticulating behind me. I looked over my shoulder and I saw there was a swan on the warpath. And I swam like I was being chased by a great white shark. I managed to avoid getting pecked to death. But as I got out, if my ego hadn't been deflated enough, I looked around and I saw some older ladies and gentlemen uh, swimming, doing some slow head-up breaststroke in nothing more than their swimming costumes and, and goggles. And I looked down at my wetsuit and felt pretty inadequate. Um, but that was the start of a love for me for long-distance open water swimming. I, um, I started to enjoy the, the challenge of swimming further and further uh, and dealing with the cold and without a wetsuit, eventually. And as I achieved more challenges and, and bigger goals, my belief in myself grew to the point my default setting has become, I look at a challenge and I think, I'll give it a go, which is incredibly empowering. And then I, uh, I found myself standing on the shores of Dover looking across to France with the not-so-crazy idea of swimming across. You see, my self-belief had kind of got the better of me, and I'd signed up to do this crazy challenge of swimming 21 miles across one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. What had I been thinking? How could I be taking on a challenge achieved by fewer people than have climbed Mount Everest? Me. But I guess that's what self-belief can do. It takes you to places you've never been before, or maybe places you never thought you wanted to go. It was night time when I started my swim, and although it was a July night, it was pretty cold, and this was, this was a couple of years ago. And as I stood on the beach, um, I was thinking, you know, I, I was starting to get a bit worried about what was ahead of me. Um, and I was as prepared as I could be. I'd, I'd swum the equivalent distance of the length of Great Britain in training over the past couple of years, but you never really know how you're going to feel until you stand at the start of a challenge like this and I felt pretty nervous. I mean, this was the last time I was going to be feeling solid ground beneath my feet for I didn't know how long. And as I looked at the black, inky water in front of me, my mind started to run away with itself. 
I thought, is it night time that great white sharks do their hunting? And what about crocodiles and, and sea monsters? They're on the prowl all the time, right? I had to calm myself down and think, jellyfish are the most dangerous animals in the channel. I'll be fine. So I looked out to my support boat that was in front of me, a couple of hundred yards in front of me. Uh, and it was, um, it was a cross between a, a target and, and a small gin palace. But importantly, it had uh, my boat pilot on board, whose job it was to navigate me across the channel and avoid the big oil tankers and the ferries. And it had my, um, my support crew on board, whose job it was to feed me and make sure I was striking the right, right balance between pushing myself hard enough but not too hard. Uh, one of the main, main dangers in the channel is hypothermia. Um, so they would check on me every now and then to make sure that I was with it mentally. So I uh, signaled to my boat that I was ready to start by raising my arms up. They signaled back with a loud burst of the horn, and the challenge began. I kind of stumbled into the water because the pebbly beach made it a bit difficult for a graceful entry. Uh, and I gave myself a few moments to, uh, to acclimatise to the cold water. And I was only wearing swimming trunks, goggles and a hat. Wetsuits are strictly prohibited by official channel swimming rules, which were started almost 150 years ago. Uh, and thankfully, goose, uh, goose fat is a thing of the past as well. So it stinks and it's really messy. Uh, but I did have a tub of Vaseline smeared over various parts of my body to deal with the inevitable chafing. Uh, channel swimming is nothing if not sexy. <laughs> Within the first minute of starting my swim, I encountered my first sea monster, and it scared the living crap out of me. I swam face first into a jellyfish, or I assume it was a jellyfish, because I couldn't see a thing. My lips were suddenly on fire, and I swam away in the opposite direction, only to get stung down the side of my body by another one. I was getting a bit panicky, and uh, I looked around for my support boat, and they were going off in the opposite direction. I was thinking, where the bloody hell are you going? <laughs> and then I remember my boat pilot saying something about them going left out the front because the, uh, the, uh, the tide was turning. So I tried to calm myself down and uh, really tentatively swam over to the boat. I was expecting to get attacked by jellyfish at any moment, but thankfully I didn't. As I got alongside the boat, I found that uh, I, made, I made a discovery. I can't swim in a straight line next to a boat. So I was swimming all over the place doing this zigzagging motion, adding unnecessary distance to an already long swim. Maybe something I can practice for next time. Um, at my first feed stop, I realised just how isolated I was going to be. Because, you see, I couldn't see a thing, literally nothing at night. It was only at a feed stop when I was next to the boat that I could see something. Um, and uh, channel swimming rules prohibit you from touching the boat or being touched by anyone on the boat. Uh, and all these rules are officiated by an observer who's also on the boat. So to feed me, they would drop my, my drinks bottle down on a line and drop it into the water. I'd grab it and, and get it down me. Uh, I mainly consumed carbohydrate drinks. I tried solids a few times, a handful of um, jellyfish, sorry, jelly babies, uh, <laughs> jellyfish on the mind, um, uh, a half a banana, but um, I found that the salt water didn't help them go down, but it certainly helped it come back up again. <laughs> so I just stuck with my, uh, my carbo drinks. And these were feed stops, not rest stops. If I hung around too long, my support crew would shout at me to get swimming again, uh, anyway, 30 seconds or more, because if I was um, st uh, standing, uh, standing around, hanging around there, I'd be getting cold, and I wasn't getting any closer to France. So I'd get my drink down me, get my head back in the water, one hand in front of the other, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. After a few hours, uh, I started to enjoy myself. You know, I'd, I'd relaxed a bit, and I was finding rhythm and fluidity in my stroke, and it, it, was, it was going well. And then the wheels fell off. I got this pain in my hip came from nowhere, and I just I suddenly sort of stopped, and I got this panic rising in my chest because it was really, really painful. Uh, I had no idea what the problem was, and I, I couldn't see anything, but I ran my hand down the side of my leg, and it, it felt kind of normal, but I'd lost a lot of my speed now, and I was forced to just kind of trudge along. The problem with this was that uh, as I slowed down, I got colder, and as I got colder, I got these um, cramps in my hip flexors, which were also really, really painful. I later found out that uh, I'd torn the cartilage in my hip joint, but obviously at the time, I had no idea. I got to a point where I was just accounting to 100 as each hand hit the water, just to give me myself something to focus on. And as I got to the 100th stroke, I'd stop, give myself a little oh, stretch, which felt fantastic, and then get back swimming again. I didn't tell my support crew, because there was nothing they could do to help me. And to verbalize it would somehow make it worse. At the end of the day, I had two choices. I could give up, or I could keep going, which was no choice at all, as far as I was concerned. So one hand in front of the other, Count to 100, block out the pain, just keep swimming. It was really, really hard going. A few hours later, the light appeared in the sky, um, and I'd hoped that I would be mid-channel by this point, which I wasn't. Uh, I'd also hoped for a spectacular sunrise, but I didn't get that either. 
the morning just kind of seeped in through the fog. But I could see a little bit more around me now, and I had a cheeky look at the horizon to see if I could see land, and I thought, ooh, I, I can see something. I took a few more strokes, had another look, I thought, that's definitely land. And I had a little chuckle to myself. I thought, my crew has obviously lied to me about my position in the channel. So um, I took a few more strokes, and I had another look, and then I thought, hang on a minute, the land is moving. And then I realised it was a massive oil tanker which was just crushing to know that there was still a long, long way left to go. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, uh, my boat pilot navigated us out of the way, so there was no chance of any collisions there. You see, the channel split up into five zones, and I'd ask my crew to let me know as I pass into each of the different zones to give me a motivational boost. And by the time we got to the fourth zone, I felt like I'd been swimming for hours. Well, well I had been swimming for hours, but it was just going on and on. I got to a point when I got to uh, feed stops, and I'd say to my support crew, is there... Uh, Anything you want to tell me? Shut up and just keep swimming, was the response I got. Which was generally the response I got to pretty much any question I asked. So one hand in front of the other, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Finally, I got the news I was waiting for. I'd passed into the final zone. I was in the French inshore, only five miles left to go, which sounded amazing and terrible at the same time. But the sun had come out, and uh, I felt the warmth on my back, and even the pain in my hip had subsided a little bit. I thought it was going to be plain sailing from here on. It was anything but. You're advised not to look at the horizon because it won't feel like it's getting any closer. And it doesn't really. First of all, I could make out just kind of the, the, the contours of the land or the, the shape of the horizon. And then slowly, painfully slowly, I saw the, 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 the colours and then I could make out a little town and then some houses and then some trees. And then I saw the cap. The shortest distance between England and France is at Cap Grenet, which we were aiming for. And as we got close to the cap, I thought my boat pilot was saying, swim for it. So I put my head in the water and I swam for it. I swam away from the boat towards the cap. And I was really exhilarated. I thought, this is it, I'm going to do it. Not realising we were still quite some way out. I had to stop suddenly because my boat pulled up in front of me. I looked up to some pretty angry faces. My boat pilot made it clear in no uncertain terms, using some choice language, that we were not going to be aiming for the, the cap. You see, the tide had turned, and it was now taking us up towards Calais. So we were going to aim for the beach on the other side of the cap, uh, which would add an extra half mile or so to the swim. But, you know, it was what it was. We just had to get there. So he told me that um, I'd have to give uh, an hour of power, give it everything I had to get across the outgoing tide. So they gave me a double-strength carbo drink to give me a bit, a bit of an extra boost and told me to swim for it. So I put my face in the water, and I started swimming like crazy. This was it. The last 14 hours of swimming would be for nothing if I couldn't do this last hour. Those hundreds and hundreds of hours of training, this is what it came down to. And I put everything I had into it. I mean, I was absolutely knackered at this point. But I, I was trying to keep good form with my stroke, but it was just, I was just splashing all over the place. But inch by inch, I was moving forwards. And then I could make out the beach, and then I saw a group of people, and then I made out it was a family playing, and then I could see the colour of their hair and the colour of their clothes. And then I saw sand beneath my feet. Oh, it looked fantastic. And I put my foot down to stand up and I sunk beneath the waves because it was deeper than I thought it was. So I took a, a couple more strokes, then a few more, and then I could stand up. Oh, it felt absolutely awesome. I took a few steps up onto the beach. I turned around, raised my arms to my support boat to show that I was clear of the water and they could stop the clock. And then I collapsed onto the beach. I was absolutely exhausted. If I'd had had the energy and my throat wasn't swollen from all the salt water, I'd have jumped up and down for joy and whooped and hollered. But all I could do was just give a little fist pump and think, I've done it. I've just achieved one of the most difficult swims in the whole world. I don't know how, but I've done it. And thinking about it, this all started looking back to that, you know, that first race I agreed to do 15 years earlier. Let me leave you with this. You can achieve anything. I'm proof of that. I have no superpowers, much to the disappointment of my younger self. I still can't fly or see through walls, but I achieve this. All it takes is to sign up for a challenge or an event that pushes you further than you've ever been pushed before. And yes, a 5K race does count. Who knows where that first event can take you? But isn't it worth finding out? Thank you.